For all the latest news in North Central Washington, go to ncwlife.com or find us on Facebook. Got a news tip? Email us at news at ncwlife.com or call 888-2020. Hi, I'm Lisa Bradshaw on Life with Lisa Bradshaw. Thanks for joining me today. I guess today I'm really excited to talk with him. He's the creator of a beautiful film called Godspeed. He's here to talk about his pilgrimage through three parishes in Scotland. So welcome, please welcome Pastor Matt Canlis to the show. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks for being here. So uh, talk a little bit about, uh, the movie is beautiful. We're here to talk about the movie, it's amazing. But really about your journey to, to, when you were visiting these parishes in Scotland, you weren't thinking about making a movie. So let's talk about how you started out there. Uh, You know, your conversation with Eugene Peterson about what you needed to do if you really truly wanted to be a pastor. I was in Vancouver studying trying to figure out how to be a pastor in my head, reading lots of good books. And Eugene said, Matt, if you want to learn to be a pastor, and not just a pastor, but a person, go find a parish. I didn't know what a parish was. For me, the word parish meant to die. But found out it was a piece of land. And in Europe, in many parts of the world, the land is divided into parishes where you can go live. In the middle of every parish is a pub, a church, a school, and of people who know the land and each other. So he said, go to Europe. And we went to Scotland to go study, my wife and I, and landed in St. Andrews, which was my first parish. So you showed up there from here knowing you were going to have a job when you arrived? No, No. I also went to study. Okay. Um, But we had just had Chapman, our first kid. We were in a new culture. Um, We thought we could make it as students, but I realized my wife is a good student and should keep studying. I should stay at home with my kid <laughs> and get a job. And so the job was for a parish assistant. There was that word, and I thought, let me see if I can get that job. The word parish or mm-hmm. assistant, which one was appealing to you? Um, both, because I was new to the whole thing and because I wanted to learn what a parish was. So I showed up to work at Alan McDonald's church and asked him where my office was. And he said, your office, Matt? I was like, oh, great, first mistake. Um, sorry, Alan, where's your office? Thinking you just have a little corner of it, perhaps. I would think so, hopefully. He didn't have an office. He took me around to his sign and showed how the church phone number was his home telephone number. So I said, Alan, where do I work? And he pointed down the street and said, start walking. Hmm. Get to know the parish. How big was the parish? How many people lived there? In St. Andrews, there's about maybe 15,000 when the university is in session. When the students leave, maybe 5,000. Well, we talked a little bit before the show about how you thought, you know, you went out and set up flyers and tried to hold a few events. Was that at the first parish you went to as as you progressed? I was as I progressed. I never lost that idea. Even by the end, I was still trying to put up posters. Um, And as I told you, those didn't work. People don't care about advertising. They only care who you are and if the thing happening is local and worth going to in its own right, not because an ad makes it look good. They would have wanted to hear about it from somebody else Mm -hmm. that they trust. Word of mouth is what people trust. And so you're in or you're out according to what people really think and say. Well, one of the things that you said that you were learned about knowing someone's name, how, how you really had to work on that because you're going door to door it was important for you to build these relationships and learn who people are, learn about their lives, but also know their name. Yeah, Eugene taught me that. Even back in Vancouver, when I was in one of his classes, uh, trying to think of something clever to ask, because he was kind of a famous professor. I was one of 60 students. For about three weeks, I thought about a really clever question to get noticed by Eugene, and eventually raised my hand. And he said, yes, Matt. And his naming me when I had never met him floored me. I forgot my question. Uh, I was just (laughs) kind of... Preparation meets opportunity, but not so much in that moment. Right. Um, So later found out that he had bumped into my wife because he always leaves his home 20 minutes early before any event so that if he meets somebody, he has a chance to talk. 
He talked to my wife, remembered her name, remembered the husband's name, Matt. That she mentioned, right. And he remembered a few days later and called mm -hmm. on me. So that began my whole journey to not trying to think about something smart to say, but notice somebody's name, which I still struggle with, but I'm trying. I do too. I thought about that when I was uh, watching your movie about how much I need to work on that, that sometimes I remember a face or a name and I've actually said out loud to some, you know, my son or somebody saying, you know, I just don't have room in my brain for that. I don't, I don't, I don't remember as well as I used to and I don't think it's going to get any better. And I thought about it when I watched your film about how that should be one of the first things I try to remember. Because everything after that, I think when somebody, even when you're in a restaurant and you see their name tag, you, you can say, well, thank you, Linda, or thank you, John, for whatever they handed you in your meal or, or your beverage, whatever it is. But there's something about speaking someone's name that makes a difference. It's the most powerful word to learn in any relationship. On Sunday, somebody showed up at a church I'd never seen before. And I asked her, what's her name? And it was Karen. And that was a week ago, actually. This Sunday, I saw her, and I completely forgot her name. And she came forward for communion. And I try and name people when they receive bread and wine. And the last minute, it came to me, and I said, Karen. And she was so surprised that <laughs> I had remembered her name. Yeah. It is a powerful moment. Right. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about, Father Giles talks, um, he's part of the film, and he talks about, uh, he says, there's a quote in the film that says, I'm a sinner, but I'm a beloved sinner. I am loved by God. And what about your journey through these parishes? Because you ended up visiting three, mm -hmm. and you share your story in the film about that. But what about visiting each of those places helped you see uh, really how people have to come to their own relationship, that, 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 mm -hmm. they, that they have to understand that they're, not perfect, but, and that's not where you're trying to lead them to perfection at all. No, there's a book out right now called Present Over Perfect, which tries to name this. But I learned it in the parish. Everyone knows more or less they're a sinner, by which I mean they have broken relationships with God, with other people, with the land. We all carry guilt of some kind. That's, that's the easy part. The hard part is to believe that you're a beloved sinner that God loves you. Your neighbor might love you or not. You can learn to love him or her. That's the part where in community you can begin to be named and loved despite your sins. That is a miracle. That happens every day in my own home with my kids and wife, sometimes <laughs> at church, sometimes right. with my neighbors. But that's what the parish began to teach me. Here were people who saw my own sins because they live next door, they heard me yell at my wife sometimes. They saw my laundry not taken in. Your whole life's on display. Despite that, they keep putting up with you. And more than that, actually even blessing you. So that was disarming to be seen and instead of rejected, embraced. Well, that really leads me to um, Alan Torrance. But I, first I want to show yeah. the trailer of the movie. And we'll come back. When we come back, we'll talk about Alan Torrance. Um, we're going to show a clip now, the trailer actually, to the film. Uh, called Godspeed. The website is livegodspeed.org. I'm talking with Matt Canlis, and he is the creator of the film. So we'll show you that trailer, and we'll come back in just a minute. Fifteen years ago, I was at seminary, finishing up my degree in history, thinking I knew a lot about Jesus, what he did, and what I was supposed to be doing. The truth is, I was miles away and centuries apart from what he did and what he wanted me to do. Some people say, ah, oh, slower means, you know, it's, it's not good, slower's not good but sometimes slow is good. If things are done here correctly, perhaps leisurely, but I think there's a far better quality of life here in this uh, small village. And he was a man uh, from America, young, fast living perhaps, and we thought, well, we, here we could maybe educate him in the more slower things of life. Um, maybe the slowing down just has to do more with more of a habit of being there. But something has to happen. You can't just rush through life.
Is your vehicle in need of a quick oil change or tune-up before hitting the road this summer? Stop by Quick Lube and Tune, the home of the good guys at 610 South Wenatchee Avenue. Hi, we're back. I'm talking with Matt Canlis today. He is the creator of a film called Godspeed. His website is livegodspeed.org. We're talking about his pilgrimage to three parishes in Scotland. And uh, we were talking about the film as well and just his journey and what he's learned along the way and what he's brought back here to Wenatchee. So thanks again for being here. Um, so we were talking before the break about the different people you encountered there, the lessons you learned. And one person that really stood out to me in the film, Alan Torrance, he, um, there was something he said to you, you, you just knocked on doors. You just went door to door meeting people. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he said when he wasn't, they weren't rich people, but he said, we're not rich folk, but to me, you're poor if you can't offer hospitality. Yes. Throughout Scotland, hospitality is a big deal. And it's not what you have or don't have, it's whether you share it. So when he said you're poor, if you can't offer hospitality, that means, yeah, if you don't share what you have, you are diminishing yourself and others. So knocking on Alan's door, I never met him before. I was intimidated by him. He's a big man who looks you right in the eye. And I thought- So you knock on his door and you say, I was like, I'm the new parish assistant. <laughs> um, hi. Sometimes it flows, sometimes you're kind of stuck. I was stuck on his door. And he sensed my awkwardness and said, why don't you come in for a cup of tea? So he's welcoming. Very welcoming. So gives me a cup of tea, has me in his kitchen, gives me a little tour of his house. Not the whole thing, but you know, that's where my six kids stay. That's my wow. garden. That's where I throw the broadsword because he likes ancient weapons. He's a fascinating man. But more than that, he's a kind man, and his hospitality began to let me be at ease. So there was a point when you, you visited with him for a while, and there's a point in the story where um, things turn for him. I don't want to tell you, say what it is. I, don't want to, I think that that's a good part of the film that people should you know, witness for themselves. But there was a discovery that he made uh, when studying with you about a map. Yeah, so I'm fresh from seminary, have lots of ideas want to tell Alan what he needs to learn. Alan was a visual guy, and at one point, hearing a story about Jesus, he said, give me a map. So I had a map at the back of my Bible, I gave it to him, and when he saw the scale of the places Jesus lived, and went face to face with people and learned their names, and recognized that this was the same scale as where he lives, uh, he said, I think I believe. And around the table, because this was a gathering of skeptics, they were like, what? Believes in Jesus, like Belie believes that believes this actually happened, the Bible happened, these that things, the stories, these stories. that Jesus tells right. about performing miracles were true. And we said, well, Alan, what's, what's going on? He had thought that Jesus had kind of been in big cities, like on tour, you know, showing his film, doing TV interviews. An evangelist or something, in a big way, on, right. When he realized it was a small area, he put two and two together and said, you don't promise to heal somebody's kid one night and the next morning wake up and the kid's bad or unhealed. The level of accountability means conspiracies are not sustainable, especially if in that day, if you lie, you get killed, you're stoned. So all of that was very convincing to him. And I'd never thought about that. As a city boy, I just didn't care about maps and walking and face to face. He got it because he was in a village. He was in a small town, and he knew what he did today, people would know about tomorrow. Absolutely. And the next day, and they wouldn't forget. It's a fishbowl. There's no escaping who you are. Right. And so that was the kind of the enlightening thing I thought that was interesting, is that if you'd been really married to the idea that we're going to read Scripture, and we're going to have a talk about this, and this is going to be a Bible study, and this is how it's going to go, right. you might not, he would, might not have even joined you. He would not have joined. It would have been boring. It would have been me talking. I made the one good decision to have them do most of the talking. And that's what made it interesting for them and for me, because I learned stuff that I would never have seen. And that's a gift too, even doing the show, having the volley of conversation where you're not trying to think of the next thing you're gonna say when someone's in the middle of sharing something, because you probably have things you wanna share. So being around the parishes that you visited, it was a lot more about listening, I'm guessing. Exactly, yeah. Instead of being the guy who had to say something, I became the listener. And that's what my mentors taught me, from Eugene to Alan to Malcolm. Everybody said the same thing. Matt, shut up, start <laughs> listening. And actually, 
that was better because, I mean, you know, after a while, you run out of stuff to say. Right. And you're not even sure if what you're saying is worthwhile. So to be in a posture of listening gives people who don't always have the chance to speak the chance to do so. If you're visiting after your funeral or visiting because there's been a tragedy or just somebody who's lonely, the gift of listening is something we need to recover. And so do you think that that's, is that one of your big takeaways from that experience? It is, yeah. Listening became, for me, a way of life. The film emphasizes walking, and that's important. But you could do a whole Godspeed about listening. So the walking part, talk about that. So you really just walked in all three parishes. Over what span of time? This is over about 13 years. Wow, 13 years you were there. So then how does the film come about? So later you're... You're done, and that's been how long ago that you were at the parish, the, la the last parish? Four years. It took four years to make this slow film. This slow film. But it was shot in three days. Right, so that, to get to that point, right. what was that like? That was just because my brother Brian called and said, Matt, you've always wanted to write a book. You're never going to finish, but please do finish one day. But in the meantime, could you shoot a brief film? And I said, yeah, we could do that. So Brian flew Danny out. Danny's at Ranch Studios in Seattle, and the three of us, over three days, with little sleep and my wife's generosity and letting me go do this when we're supposed to be packing, produced a film. It was going to be five minutes, um, mm -hmm. but it was going I so well. I can't see how. Well, we were just going to do a few interviews and talk about walking, yeah. um, but it got bigger, and you've seen what's happened. Yeah, I've seen the film. It's really incredible. It's about 36 or 39, what is it's it? It's 34 minutes. Thir yeah. 33, I know. And you, can, you are allowing people to watch it for free. You don't have to download or anything. We'll get to that part. But one of the things that I really enjoyed about watching the film is I still, I think it could have been an hour and a half. I think it could have been a you know, full feature film because there were still things I wanted to learn. So that's a good thing when you, maybe you'll do a sequel perhaps. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> so then when you're finishing up the film or you're going there to shoot this film and you're there for three days, um, you've cultivated those relationships. How welcoming was everyone to you? They were very welcoming. So yeah, really this film took 13 years to make and we just showed up for three days and talked to people. Because of the relationships, right. because of the names, the conversations flowed. I mean, originally we had a whole script, but an hour into it, Danny's like, Matt, get rid of the script. Just talk to people. And that's what made the film work. These relationships where I'm talking to people who know me, I know them, and so it flowed. So then the, one of the other parts about, uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, I thought about when watching the film is these parishes in Scotland. So you went to three of them. The largest was 15,000 people 15, and the smallest. 15,000, then 5,000, and then 500. So do you think it was good that you started out with the bigger one and got smaller? Yeah, Coming I need, from a big they needed city. to break me in. Um, yeah. So yes, I was thankful for that gradual learning curve. So when you did the film, um, you talk, uh, you know, it's all about these parishes in Scotland, but how is, I figure people probably ask you, how are they different from Wenatchee? Because mm -hmm. you're a pastor here at a church, which, which church? It's Let's called Trinity Charit, Church. Yes. Um, at Trinity Church. So how, is, how are the parishes similar? So we're a parish as well, where you are as a parish, because of your definition, by definition. Yeah. So how are they the same as opposed to different? Well, they're similar in that they're still land-based. Everyone still, even if they drive or don't think about it, is connected to the land. Wenatchee is a place that appreciates its land, whether it's the water or the orchards or the roads that just got plowed and now coming up. We're connected to physical land. The same is true in Scotland. Many of these places are farms. Many of them are where they manufacture or grow what they need to live by. So there's an agricultural connection that's similar. The difference is because we're driving so fast and on the move and so spread out and have our choice of where to shop, where to go to church, where to go to school, sometimes you can get so spread out that you don't notice where you live. Thus the call for people to walk. During Lent, some of us have said, we're not shopping at big stores. We're going to shop at Plaza Superjet because that's within walking distance of the church. Um, those are the kinds of decisions that the parish helps you think about and at least be deliberate about. So what about the people? What are the differences in the people? Hmm. One big difference is that 
Can I tell a story that sure. answers it? So yes. the other day I was at Costco and I was getting my gas filled up and the attendant there was so attentive to me, I eventually said to him, why are you so kind? <laughs> Where are you yeah. from? Yeah. And he said, I'm from Kenya. Oh. And he said, I immigrated here three years ago. And um, I said, what have you learned about life in America? And he said, in America, you have watches, but you don't have time for people. Hmm. In Africa, we don't have watches, but we have time for people. And so whether you're in Scotland or Africa or America, you'll be similar if you find a way to use time to be present to people and to land and to God. That's the common connection I hope anywhere can live out anywhere they live. To have that understanding mm -hmm. of the difference. And I think that that's part of why, you know, when we're growing up or we think about traveling, if you hadn't traveled to Scotland and had that experience, it would make you a different pastor here in the United States for mm -hmm. sure. So you walk still here? I do. Visit? Um, yeah, I walk at least once a week around the parish. And on Sunday, I bumped into somebody who, her name is Julia. It's her son, David who painted the mural at Metal Market. She'd heard about the film, heard I'd said something, and wanted to meet me. I was a little worried, like maybe I'd said something wrong. But she said, no, I want you to hear my son's story. So Julie and I will have coffee next week in her house, which is within walking distance of the church. And face to face, she'll give me what Alan Torrance once gave, which is a story and questions and a connection to this particular place. So the film was able, you aired the film at Liberty Theater. Mm -hmm. They did a showing there. When we mm -hmm. come back, I wanna talk about that, the huge success of it, mm -hmm. and let people know where they can watch the film online. Mm -hmm. You have um, it available to people for free, mm -hmm. which is very generous. I think it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful film. Uh, the film is called Godspeed. The website is livegodspeed.org. We're talking with Matt Canlis, a pastor here in Wenatchee, who's traveled a voyage to Scotland and back. When we come back, we'll talk more about the film, let you know where you can watch it and talk about the premiere that happened at Liberty Theater. Please join us weekly for the 12th District with yours truly, Carrie Condotta. Check your channel guide for times or go to ncwlife.com for details. Hi, we're back with Life at Lisa Bradshaw show. We're talking with Matt Canlis. He's a pastor here in Wenatchee. He created a beautiful film called Godspeed. His website is livegodspeed.org. Uh, you had a viewing at Liberty Theater that was sold out. Yeah, it was packed. They had to close the doors. And a lot of youth kindly got out of their seats and sat in the aisles so that some older folks could find a seat. It was a, a wonderful night. So you have the film streaming, well, not stream, but you can watch it on online. You don't have to download it. You just click on the website. I couldn't believe it. It's the easiest thing. And it's a beautiful, beautiful film. And you have a tip jar on your website, which I thought was funny because the landscape of the film and the website's so beautifully done. And then it has this cute little idea of a tip jar. So, but you don't, you don't really ask for help. You, you're really humble about that. The idea of the film was a gift to people. Um, but we're also trying to raise a few funds to do projects like this. Mm -hmm. So that's why the film's free. And yeah, but you can visit the tip jar if you want. Yeah, that'd be <laughs> a good thing. Well, I appreciate you being here for sure. The website again is livegodspeed.org. The film is called Godspeed and it's a beautiful 34 minute film. You can go to the website and watch it today or any other time, day or night. It's there for your viewing pleasure online. So thanks for being here. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate it. We'll be back next time, I guess. We're wrapping it up, and thanks for joining us on Life with Lisa Bradshaw. Stay up to date with what's happening in North Central Washington. Go to the NCW Life community calendar at ncwlife.com.